can you run when you don't know the way of the Spirit? Oak House Church brings to you the word of life which is able to build you up and offer you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. Sit back and listen, and may your life become more like that of Christ as you encounter His Word. God bless you. We start with the, the foundation of the Christian faith. The importance of foundation can never be overemphasized. The importance of foundation can never be overemphasized. And what do I mean by that? No matter how many times you talk about foundation, you will not have done a proper work. You will never say it is too much. We have not understood from because it's very critical. Because the importance of foundation is that when you have a good foundation, you can be uh, rest assured that the structure you are going to put on it is going to stand and it will stand, if not forever. Or even if it's not going to be forever on this side of life, at least it is going to last for tens and hundreds of years because a proper foundation is laid. And foundation determines the height of the building because if you lay a foundation for three bedroom flat, you cannot put any other structure on it. If you do, is going to collapse. Maybe not immediately, but after a time, it's going to collapse. And when the collapsing will start, it is not going to inform you or tell you about um, the collapse, that it's going to collapse at certain time. The collapsing of the building is just like how death occurs. And when that building collapses, a lot of people are not, people are not aware and you are not prepared for it and all of that. So it takes people by surprise and the whole building crashes and then every other thing that is under that building or in that building is destroyed. If there are lives, their lives are gonna be destroyed. So the extent of your foundation will determine the extent of the longevity of that building. So let's bring it down to, or back to what we are dealing with now, spiritual speaking. <clears throat> Spiritually speaking, your Christian foundation is of utmost importance in, the, in every single thing that you're going to do as a Christian. When we have, we have had a, um, a whole lot of, um, when you hear people speak, when you hear people talk, when you see the reason, their argument, the way they argue and reason uh, the word of God and all of that, you can readily know where the problem is coming from. Majority of the problem we have in the body of Christ today has to do with the foundation. If you begin to trace them, they're all traceable to foundation. When you see somebody who, who doesn't have, doesn't have um, confidence in God, maybe at, point, at one point in time or the other, something happens and the person's faith begins to falter and he doesn't have confidence and some people begin to blame God or some people begin to question God as to why this and why that and all of that. The bottom line is that there is lack of good foundation. And so in book of Psalm 11 verse 3, it says, if the foundation be destroyed, what then is left for the righteous? Foundation is of utmost importance in our lives. And so we need to look, have a, 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 um, another look at what that foundation is all about. And then um, what did God say concerning this foundation? Because when you don't have a proper understanding and grasp about foundation, your understanding of the word of God and the interpretation and all of that is going to be faulty. And when your understanding is faulty, your actions are going to be faulty. And if your action is going to be faulty, the result or the outcome of your life is going to be faulty. So, we'll start by looking at what that foundation is. And we said that the foundation of our Christian faith is about a person called Jesus Christ. 
So we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 9. It says, For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. Verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, not just a builder, not just a, uh, not just a master builder, but a wise master builder. And this wisdom is not the wisdom that comes from him, Paul, that was writing. It was the wisdom that came from God as a wise master builder. So it takes wisdom to be able to build the foundation. And so he said, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builded up thereon. But let every man take heed how he builded Thereupon, he said he was the one. Paul said, I am the one, I am the one that is saddled with the responsibility of laying the foundation of the Christian faith. And now he said, one person lays the foundation, then another one begins to build upon it. And he says, Let those of them that are going to build upon it take heed. Be extremely careful so that you build according to specification, according to the plan. Because if you build, start building wrongly on that same foundation, the whole building is going to collapse up to that foundation. And so he said in verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There is no other foundation that can be laid. There is no other foundation. I know you know this. You see, sometimes I read this and I repeat it over and over and over. Sometimes I close my eyes, I repeat it over and over. And there is no other foundation that any man should lay except Christ Jesus. Jesus is a foundation. Jesus is the only foundation. There are no, there is no other foundation. There is no other, there is no attachment, there is no adjoining foundation to it. Jesus and Jesus alone is the foundation upon which every other thing you are going to do as a Christian or believer in Christ stands. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stone, and wood, and hay, subtle, or stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. Okay, so where I'm going to is the one who is the foundation, which is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. A lot of people have different foundation. I hope you know that. We can, when you start, when you, when, when you don't have a proper understanding and somewhere along the line you begin to look to another person, okay, you have deviated from the foundation. Anything that has to do with foundation is very, very, very seriously taken into account by Jesus Christ. God does not play with any. He might play with any other thing that you are doing. You might, maybe the color of the building or, or the type of roofing you are going to put or whether there is, is going to be yellow light or red light or whether it's going to be lead light, whatever it is. Whether you are going to have AC or not AC or fan or um, uh, central AC, whatever it is, that's not the issue. You can have anything you want to. But when it has to tamper with the foundation, that was why Paul had to stand right before the entire people that gathered and rebuked Peter because what he was doing was affecting, he was foundational. 
that now that you are saved, you are not saved because you are circumcised. It is faith in Christ. It's about Jesus Christ. It's not about circumcision. That's why he says circumcision or no circumcision, what matters is Christ. So he was trying to take people's mind and attention away from the central focus, which is Christ. And that is why you cannot keep your mouth shut. When, they found, when you are there and the foundation is being, anything that takes the glory away from Christ, anything that takes people's mind or people's eyes or focus outside of Christ, you are tampering with foundation. And that is a very serious issue. For example, somebody preaches a message about resurrection or maybe a message, any kind of message and all of that, very powerful and stuff like that. At the end of the day, you tell people that how they are going to connect to what you have said so that God will open the heavens and all of that is through gift, is through sowing seed so that that thing will be activated. You are tampering with the foundation. It's a very, very serious matter. But you see, we take them so lightly. And that is why you see the kind of things we are seeing today in the body of Christ. Foundation is something that no man, you don't have that right. That's why Paul say, and when you talk about the, the foundation, is, is foundation are laid by the apostles and the prophets. And these are the the apostles and prophets of the Lamb. They are the ones that have laid that foundation and you dare not tamper with that foundation or say anything contrary about Jesus. Everything is focused on Jesus Christ. The whole scripture in the Old Testament, all those um, uh, ceremonies and um, uh, rites they, are, they were carrying out and all of that, everything was pointing at one man and one person and that is Jesus Christ. No other person but Christ. Outside of Christ, there is nothing about Christianity. Is the center. Now, let's look at what God is saying concerning him. He said, um, look at Acts of Apostles chapter 4, verse 12. He says, in Acts of Apostles, Apostles chapter 4, verse 12, he says, there is no other name given, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven. There is one name under heaven. There are not two. One person in the whole of the universe, they sent a name. That's why the songwriter says, there is no name that is so sweet. There is no other name. That's why that name is so special. God in heaven did not give man any other. There is something about name of Jesus Christ. It's the only name that is given to man. There are no other two names. So if you are calling in the name of any other person and all of that, you won't get the attention of heaven. You won't get the attention of God. He is one man, one Jesus, one name, given among men under heaven. He didn't say he gave it to under America or under Europe or under Africa. Under heaven. And heaven covers the whole of the universe. Whether you are Hindu, whether you are... Greek or whether you are Hebrew, wherever you are, whoever you are, there is only one name. You can interpret that name in your own dialect, but it is still Jesus Christ. In Igbo language, they call him Jesu. In Yoruba, they call him what? Jesu, Christi. In Hausa, I don't know what, they, Yeda, what do you call them? What do you call him? Jesu is the same man. So you go to God in that name. Now look at what he says in Hebrew chapter 1, verse 1. God who at sundry times, that is in the past, at different time in the past, and in diverse manners, in different ways, in time past, he spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. You read the Old Testament and all of that. God was speaking to his people through the prophets. Then that dispensation has come and gone. It has ended. And now he says, verse 2, he had in these last days, when did the last day begin? The last day began at the coming of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ came, he was born. 
That was when the last day began. He said, had in this last day spoken unto us by who? So God is speaking to us. So when you say the Holy Spirit said, it's actually Jesus Christ that is speaking. Or you are interpreting it, you understand it, because there are three persons in one God. It's the same person. So God, through, the, through his son, Jesus Christ, began to speak to us in these last days. From the time Jesus came, he wasn't, that is why he's not the prophet, he's not the law of Moses. It's not about Moses, it's not about the prophets Isaiah and Co. But about Jesus Christ, God began to speak through his son. So everything that you're hearing today, everything that the heaven is saying today is coming through one man, Jesus Christ. He is the center of attraction. He is the centerpiece. I don't need to tell you and I don't want to tell you about the different opinions and all of that that people have about Christ. Or maybe I will tell you one of the religions which has taken a long, a lot of hold on the people. Give me Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. The only person you need to hear from is Jesus Christ. If you are hearing, you hear from him. Because he's the only name given under heaven among men for salvation. And he is the one that God is saying he's speaking through God. He is God's mouthpiece. So he is the mouthpiece of God. He is God's only representative. He didn't give us any order. Even the Holy Ghost did not come from God. He came through Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit we are talking about is through Christ he came. So everything must come from Jesus Christ. That is why when you deviate, even in your message and all of that, when if you want to experience the power of God, if you want to see the power of God manifest in your meeting or whenever you are preaching or whatever it is you are doing, you center on Christ. That is why in Acts of Apostles, the Bible kept talking about and they preached Christ. And they preached the way. They call him the way. Because he said, I, Christ, I am the way, the truth, and life. So when you center on Jesus Christ, he will glorify his name. This is my well, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He's not pleased in any other person except one person. Hear ye him. Okay. In First Timothy chapter 2 verse 5, he says, there is only one, the same one mediator. You can see the emphasis. There is only one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ. No other person. Everything is about Jesus Christ. Because he's a foundation. There is no other one. There is no other person. It's not Peter. It's not Paul. It's not John the Baptist. It's not angels. Because before now, uh, people were worshipping angels. Till today, there are men who are, there are so many denominations that are worshipping angels. And that is why he said in Hebrew chapter 1, go to Hebrew chapter 1 verse, uh, verse 6. Okay, yeah, he said in verse 6, he said, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten, into the world, he said, and let all the angels of God do what? Worship him. Let all the angels, all the angels, the trillions upon trillions upon trillions of angels, uncountable number of angels, let them all worship Jesus Christ. You don't worship an angel. You don't burn candle to an angel. You don't do anything with an angel. As a matter of fact, angels are under the command of Jesus Christ. We don't worship angels. We don't glorify angels. You remember when John the Beloved in the island of Patmos, the angel that came to give him message, he fell down before the angels and the angels said, you want to finish me? Just get up, don't try it again because he's not worthy to receive worship. 
He said, because I am your fellow servant. He said, it's only God, Christ, and him alone you will worship. That is how you know. You know, some people, when you, when you begin to see visions and you have dreams and all, all sorts, you see where the foundation is. You see the problem with the foundation. And an angel will appear to you. That is why we have the church of Mormon and the church of Latter-day Saints and all kinds of whatever that you are seeing today that, that are commanding millions of millions of followers. How? It was one Joseph Smith. He was in the bush somewhere praying and waiting on God and he was genuine. And then an angel appeared to him. And after talking with him and all of that, and he said he should kneel down and he knelt down. And the angel prayed and laid hands on him and all of that and commissioned him. And who are you to tell him that it is not? You know why the problem? You know why? He didn't have foundation. He did not have a good family. That is what led to this. How many of you know the church of Mormon? You know these people that wear white and foundation. Let all the angels worship him. And only him you should worship. But no. And that is why I've even met, I've, I've seen so many of them, many. They had a dream. They had a vision or dream, whatever he said, he called it. One lady, he said he was sitting and then they everywhere became so white. He saw a bean coming and that bean was so white. And then the shelf that he had, she had in the house and all of where there are glasses and all of that, started vibrating and shaking. And then he was, she was afraid. And that light was approaching her and all of that. And then she fell on her face, shaking and fearful. When, while she was talking, I said, so she said it was Jesus. He was telling us her experience, how she encountered Christ. And this is what she had been doing. You know, it, it wasn't that day she told me about that experience that it happened. It had happened many years. So you can imagine that is what she held on to and believed it and all of that. Many years later, she stood before one man called him, that called himself Pastor Fred. And after narrating the visions and all of that, and Pastor Fred, he said that he was a demon. Do you think, how do you think he will hold it? Regard it. That was the first and the last she showed up. And when you look at her life and all of that, you say it's messy. It's messed up. Foundation. And when you tell our people, sit down, get the, because the Bible says that the devil has transformed himself into what? An angel of light. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He comes, the, the Bible said that God dwells in the light unto which no man can see nor approach. You see, we went to see somebody, visit somebody today in the hospital. So the man was telling us the dream that he had. So he said he, 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 was, he found himself in a, in a sea. The whole of that sea was black everywhere and all of that. And some millions upon millions of tiny, tiny, tiny creatures that look like the, side, the, the shape of a flame. But the, that shape of flame is black everywhere. And then somewhere along the line, she, he saw one tall bee that is radiating he said he's white from head to toe. He said the wood, the head is white, the hair is white, the feet everywhere, the clothes. He said he's sparkling white. And he said he's very tall. He said he's about 20 times taller and bigger than the biggest of those creatures that he saw. And while he was talking, he was giving the description. So as he was doing that description, I was running my mind my mind was scanning the scriptures while he was talking. So, but thank God at the end of the day, he concluded he was an angel. Of course, it couldn't have been Jesus Christ. Because if you read the book of Revelation, chapter 1, you see the picture of Jesus Christ. If he actually come in his glory, you will see him that way. And you can't even see him and stand. Even John in the island of Patmos, it was a vision. In that vision, he couldn't stand. He was like a dead man. If Jesus Christ show up and appear in his glory, you can't stand. Even in your vision, even in your dream, you can't stand. So probably one of those angels that besought the face of God regularly. 
God, he was shining and all. So, if you don't have the understanding of uh, the foundation of who Jesus Christ is, as you are making progress in your spiritual work, in your prayer life and all of that, you are going to start having different encounters and uh, um, appearances and all of that at one time or the other. And the devil is going to come out to make sure that he destroy your faith, destroy your Christian work by creating all kinds of confusion and all of that to you. So when you don't know exactly what it is, for example, when you read the Revelation chapter chapter 4, you go to Revelation chapter 19, you see the two white horses and all of that. If you don't read in between the line, you will not, you will think that the Revelation chapter 6, you will think that it is uh, Jesus Christ. And then I have heard so many ministers, preachers, preaching about that, from that Revelation chapter 6, that it was Jesus Christ. But it wasn't Christ. It's when you read Revelation chapter 19 from verse 6 and all of that, you see the picture of Jesus Christ. You see what, who he is. The whole of this problem is as a result of foundation. Foundation has destroyed a lot of people, people's life. And again, because we don't, do you know the reason why people go into diabolical means in the churches they bury cow and bury all kinds of things and they have all kinds of charms and stuff like that and some go to wash their eyes and then to anoint their tongue and all of that so that as they are speaking things will be happening and stuff like that why do they have to do that because they don't have foundation they don't believe in that foundation even even if they have heard it even if they have heard about that foundation, they don't believe it and that is what is giving rise to all of this. And then you see all the people that have been swayed. And when you are talking to them, they will never listen to you. They will never believe it. So we have them in their hundreds, in their thousands, and tens and twenties and hundreds of thousands that are all misled. That's why the Bible was talking about in Ephesians chapter 4, that verse 13, and all of that. He said, until all, all, all of us come to the unity of faith, so that we no longer be like children that are tossed up and down by every wind of doctrine. Because they are everywhere. You know the popular John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. And who did he give? Jesus Christ. He's the only gift. The only gift given to man. They are not two. The only name given. The only one that God is speaking through. The only one that God says you should hear from. Everything is pointing at Jesus Christ and no other person. And so that is the reason why you must do everything in your life. You must focus your attention. You must know him. The essence of this meeting or this particular study is so that your root, now when you know him, so that your root will grow deep into him. I'm talking about faith. So that your faith, you be rooted in him, grounded in him. Now, let's, let's look at um, who is Jesus Christ to God? Who is Jesus Christ to God? I remember in Matthew 16, Jesus Christ was asking them, who do men say that I am? Some say you are prophets. Some say you are Elijah. Some say you are Pastor Fred. Some say you are <laughs> more kinds of nonsense names. He now asks Peter, you, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ. Then Jesus now made it to me, say, you have spoken well, Peter, because your intelligence or education or whatever has not given this to you. It is by my Father in heaven. It is my Father in heaven that giving you this revelation that you are speaking now. So, what is Christ to God is a Messiah. Christ is a gift from God to mankind. 
Now, who is Christ? Where did Christ originate? You may not know where God came from, but Jesus Christ, where did he come from? Who is Christ? Before the incarnation, you know what is incarnation? Hello? You know what is incarnation? Incarnation is God becoming man, becoming flesh, to have an incarnate. Something like when we say a reincarnation, that is your father, your grandfather has come back to life. That was dead, now has come back to life. So you are incarnating, you are trans, trans, uh, um, you are you are translating from the realm from one realm to another realm. So this one is incarnation before the incarnation before he became flesh. Who was he before he became flesh and dwelt amongst us? Jesus Christ was the eternal word. When you see God speaks, that word that God speaks is Christ. And you see, you cannot, you cannot separate a man from his word. Your word, you and your word are one. You are the same. And can you imagine if we have somebody like God and God doesn't speak, God is dumb. He cannot communicate, he can't speak. Then the essence of being God is no, is lost. So what made God God actually is because he speaks. And his words are different from the words of man. So Jesus Christ was before the incarnation, before he became flesh. He was the eternal word with the Father. John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning, in the eternal past, in the eternal past was what? Was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. So who is Jesus Christ? How did he exist before he became flesh? He existed as a word. And that word is God because my word is your, my bond. They say your word is your bond. That's why the Bible says, he that sweareth to his own heart and changeth not. Because you can't take back your word. Your word is you. You are your word. You can't say this and then change. You are not. You can't. That's why the Bible says concerning God, he says his words are yea and amen. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent, that he change his mind. No, he doesn't. Because by two immutable things for which it is impossible for God to lie, God is bonded with his word. His word is God. God is his word. And his word is his spirit. That's why Jesus said, the word that I speak to you, they are life and they are spirit. So you can see, is to show you the origin where Jesus Christ, he had been God with the Father. If you can trace the origin of God, then you can trace the origin of Jesus Christ. If you can say where God came from, you can see, you can see where, Jesus, where Jesus Christ came from as well. So that is why you see God is word, is Jesus. Jesus is a word. You can't separate the two. Can you separate me from my word? Can you try it? Is there any technology or system or whatever that can do that? That's why your word is your bond. And that word you are saying is spirit. In Revelation 19, 13, and he was clothed with a vessel dipped in blood and his name is called, this is a mystery. We don't understand it. Maybe when we get to heaven, we may understand but for now, I don't know how they understand it. The word produced man, and that person is the word of God, and that person is God. And God is the word, is the word that is moving about. And he calls the that word of God Jesus Christ, and calls Jesus Christ the word of God. 
In other words, it was actually God that came. It was actually God that came. You cannot separate God from Jesus Christ. You cannot separate, the same way you cannot separate yourself. There is no way Matilda will be outside now talking and somebody who has known Matilda will be inside this church. You will not be able to know that it is Matilda that is speaking outside. Is it possible? You will definitely know. There is no, no matter how she tries to, to waste it. What are spirit? Spirit are what? In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. And this word was with God. And this word was God. And then, in Revelation, that Revelation 9.19, he said, and there was, um, it was clothed with a virtue dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And he was going. So when you get to heaven, you will see a person who wears a vesture that is dipped in the blood, probably on a horse, riding. And they say, who is this one? They say, is the Word of God. Is the Word of God. They see him, is coming. Or you can say, is Jesus Christ coming. Now what you are reading from the pages of the Bible is him. He is inside that pages of the Bible you are reading. And when you read it and put it inside of her, that word is Jesus Christ is living inside of you. And then when you speak it out, it's Jesus Christ. You know, I remember saying some time ago, many years ago, I was taking a prayer walk in the street and all of that in the evening, late in the evening time. And I was, I heard a voice from within me say, anytime you quote the word, when anytime you quote the word of God, that's what I heard it clearly. Anytime you quote God's word, you are bringing God direct life and direct into that situation. When you quote what he says, not when you paraphrase him, he say, he used that word, he said, when you quote me, when you quote my word, you bring me into that particular situation. That's how you bring God in a particular. When you speak God's word, you bring God into that situation. But when you are, you can be saying other things and, you know, you can say your, that is why it is not in the length of the prayers that you make. It is in making contact with him. And what moves God is when you hold up, because he say, I watch over my word to bring it to come to pass. That is why there are two kinds of if I say faith now, or, or okay, let me not say faith. There are two ways you get God's word. The first is the direct word that Jesus Christ said, or the direct word that you read in the Bible. Because the word of God, the Bible tells us that no prophecy is of any private interpretation. He said, but men, holy men of old, they spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them. So what they were saying was God actually speaking through them. Just like a madman is speaking on the street there. He's not that man that is speaking. There is a spirit in him that is speaking. He's those demons. If you have done deliverance on people and all of that, you see somebody who was normal before the deliverance and all that. Somewhere along the line, the power of God came upon him, the Holy Spirit and stuff like that. And then the voice of that person changes. And you see a whole lot of things. He's not that person that is speaking. He's the demon that is inside him that is using his... Um, vocal cord to express himself. The same way, the same way God was the one speaking through these men as they opened their mouth. They yielded their vessel and God was speaking to them or through them and what they were saying, they were putting them down in a written form. That's why we have the word of God. That's why it is called the word of God. And that is why he said the word of God, this word of God is quick, 
He is powerful. He is sharper than any two-edged sword. He pierces through the dividing and sunder of the soul and the body, and is a discerner of the thought and the intents of the man, uh, uh, intents of the heart, and all of that. That is to show you the word is Jesus Christ. So anytime you say, for example, it is written, thou shalt say unto the righteous, it is well with your soul. That is direct word of God. When you say it, God comes to honor whatever because you cannot call somebody. It's just like you are here now and you are calling Mr. Andrew, Mr. Andrew. Will you pretend as if you are not the one? Or maybe, self, I'll give him that example. For example, in a marketplace where you have thousands of people moving about everywhere in every direction. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of all of that, you just heard, Mr. Andrew, Mr. Andrew. You know, there are many Andrews. But will you turn? You will turn to know who is the one calling you. It has happened to me several times. I will be walking on the road. I will hear pastor, pastor. I will turn thinking that I'm the one. Lo and behold, he's one, one man that is uh, tightening, uh, fixing tire in the car and all of that. They are calling pastor and stuff like that. The same way, you cannot put the word. You can't put the word of God without bringing God. That is why he said, I've said it the other time, that is why he said that God will judge every idle word that comes from your mouth. Do not use the name of the Lord in vain. Don't use the name of the Lord. Don't be careless. You see that name? That name is, is special. That name is revered. That name is holy. The word of God is holy. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, before they read the Torah, they, that is the Old Testament book. The book of the Old Testament, that's what it's called, the Torah. Before they read it, you know what they do? They will first of all go wash their, do ablution. They wash the hand and the ears and the eyes and the legs. and In other words, cleanse themselves from all filthiness. Because you must be holy to handle that book, to even speak. Not everybody is given the, the authority or the right to hold the, the book and to speak or to preach. It's not everybody, oh. But now, in the New Testament, it is given to everybody who has access. However, that you have access does not mean that you should carry it anyhow and be read. That is why he said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, he said, lay aside first every word. Every word. Wait. You know, lay aside all filthiness of the flesh, evil speaking, hypocrisy, lying, and all of that. And then embrace the word of in James chapter 123. You know what he says? Lay aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and with meekness take the word of God that is able to save your soul. So before you go to the word of God, before you handle it, is is holy, is sacred. We threw away those um practices in the Old Testament and all of that. No, it's a type and shadow of the new. In the old, they use physical water and all of that to wash But In the New Testament, what do we do? The blood. You plead the blood and repent and turn away. Cleanse yourself before you pick that word so that that word will come, the light will come and then it will do its work. But we are dealing with a person here. So anytime you are speaking the word of God, you know you are contact, you are talking about a person. You are discussing about a person. It's not just the word of God. You, say, you are reading the word of God. Just read. You are talking and discussing a person. It's just like I am sitting down here. You are discussing about me in the presence of every other person. I'm sitting here. You, I'm looking at you and someone, all of you are discussing about me and talking about me and all of that. And physically you are seeing me. You are seeing me physical, physically and you are discussing about me and I'm looking at you. You know, you'll be very careful what you say. Is it not? But because, but because we don't see him physically, we become loose with our words. He's a person. The word is a person. He's a reality. And that word is a spirit. Give me John 1.3. All things were made by how many things? 
how many things. You know, you know the essence of all this is to show you who you should be mindful of. That was the reason why when they came to tell Jesus the word, the one that made all things, including Herod, they came to tell him that this Herod you made, the Herod that you made, was looking for you to kill you. <laughs> he answered him well. He said, go tell that fox. I cast out devil today. The second day I heal. They thought they will perfect my work. He said, no man has given you that right. The Herod was looking to kill the one that he created. He said, all things, including Herod that they said was looking for him to kill him. All things were made by him. And without him was nothing, was not anything made that was made. Anything without, outside of Jesus Christ is nothingness. That's why the Bible said when they knew God, they knew God. God has revealed himself to every man, whether you are a madman or your head is clean or not clean and all of that. God has revealed himself to every man that is created that came into this life. The Bible says in the book of John, he says he's the light that lighted every man that comes into the world. Give it to me, please. John chapter 1, I think verse 5. You see, that was the true light which lighted how many people? Who? How many? Every man. He didn't say some. Every man that comment into this world. Whether you are, whether you are Sama Bin Laden or whether you are Shekaru and all of that, he is the light. There is a witness inside them. The only thing is that in Romans chapter 1, 16, he says, when they knew him as that God, they refused to glorify him as God. So what did God do? He gave them a reprobate mind that they will never know the truth. He now said, all things were made by him. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. Colossians, for by him, you see, we are how many things? All things created that are in heaven, even where God, even where God is. He was the one that did the creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth by Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, there will be no creation. Without the word, there will be no creation. Because God has to say. So God is equal to Jesus and Jesus is equal to God. That's why Philippians 4, 5 says, Let this mind be in you as it was also in Christ. Though he was God, though he was God, he did not count it robbery to be equal with God. He didn't feel that God was cheating him. Though he was God, Jesus is God. God is Jesus Christ. There is no difference. How they are separated is the same person, is the same one person, is the same person existing as Christ and existing as the Holy Spirit. That's why he's, the, the, the word is spirit. Jesus said the word that I speak to you is spirit. So inside that word is the spirit. And the word... The spirit that is inside the world is inside God. So all is in one. There's no separation. Hello. This is the reason why when God says, when you say that God says, it must be the same thing that the world says. It must be the same thing that the spirit is saying. Let me tell you the truth. The Holy Spirit, no matter the kind of revelation or deep revelation, no matter what it is, you must find it in the Word of God. He can't speak anything else. The Word is Spirit, and that Spirit is inside God. They are one. 
They agree. The Bible tells us. They are in agreement. So somebody will come and tell you God is said. That God has told me. What he is telling you, you go back to the word of God. You find out. It might not be exactly. For example, God told me. I come down and tell you that God told me to go and marry Chica. And I'm on the pulpit here. I said, God just told me now that I should, you should be my wife. God is speaking to me. You might not find it where it is written in the Bible, Pastor Fred, to marry Chica. You won't find it in the Bible. True or false? However, however, but God has said, you cannot marry two wives. Neither can you divorce your wife or divorce your husband. If you marry another person while your wife is still alive, you are committing adultery. So God cannot break his word. God is not an author of confusion. You know, somebody say that God is going to move in a dimension and manifestation that in the man is not used to. But the Bible says there is nothing new under the heaven nothing new. There is nothing again. God has finished every. There is nothing new and is written in the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes several times. Nothing new under this heaven. There is nothing God will do or say that he has not done. And somebody says that God said to him that you are going to be speaking. I'm going to from today I'm going to be speaking to you through the clouds. In the cloud. That's when the glory of God shows up. Maybe you hear the voice of God in the midst of that glory. Or the, when the glory of God shows up, he will be giving you revelations and all of that about. But they have said it from the pulpit. Why? How do I know that it is not true? Because God will never break his word. There are ways God will speak to his children. is found in the Bible. He even tells us, he says, judge every spirit. Judge it to know whether they are from God or not. Because there are other spirits that can be speaking. There are voices out there in the air. You know, that doctor, he was actually overwhelmed about what he saw. He said, the demons that he saw, if you see how they were sweeping people in their millions, sweeping people into hell, that was Wednesday last week. He had COVID. He was battling the battle of his life. So he saw himself in a black sea. He said there was no end to that sea. Black. No end. Those, you know when you talk about sea, his people say there was no end. Black. Human beings. And they were coming. If you see, if you, we don't know what is going on. Then he saw demons of different sizes, some tiny like this. But you see that tiny demon that is like this, that tiny demon like this. If you take his hand, tie the two hands behind him, then cover his eyes with eye cloth hmm? and tie his legs. If he shakes his body like this, the whole people in Lagos will die. He will finish it. They are very dangerous. And in the midst of it, he saw one and one angel. It's a very big and tall, standing afar. He stretched forth his hand and pulled him out. The man was saved from death. He said he had already given up on Saturday night. We don't know what goes on on this other side. This life is life is spiritual. It is oh God. How can we how can we say this thing so that people will understand? I don't know, but he said God told him that he was the one because that guy <laughs> that guy he said he he was almost taking us as God, me and my wife. To the extent that even if Jesus Christ tells him something, he will say, wait, let me hear from Pastor Fred and Reverend Oyes. He said he was coming to that point. He was just taking us like God. 
He said, that day God said to him, because we promised him we are coming on Saturday. Because that Saturday he was very critical. So he was believed, he said that if we come here and pray for him, that will be the end. He will be fine. So he was just waiting. So he said, that night God spoke to me. See, I'm the one that stopped them from coming. For me, I don't know that one. I don't know why Jesus will punch up my tire. Because I was making that U-turn. I followed the road I shouldn't have followed. Instead of going straight, I made a U-turn. And I joined one way. Then the last man people came out. Carried out their spike, threw it under my car, and it came punch up. And we stayed there. We didn't go again. Their whole rain on Saturday, we were there when it started and finished. And so the whole of that VGC and all of that was flooded with water. You can't go. He said it was God that stopped us. So that we won't come and pray. Life, spirit. The earlier you know that, the better. Many things you see that you do. You see, you wake up. You want to go to Ireland and come back and all of that. There are things that have been pressed. You are not the one doing it. There is somebody. Colossians 1, 16, 17. By him we are all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth whether they are visible, whether they are, what are those invisible things? You can talk about it. You know the visible things. Anything visible, that's visible is what you can see, including this carpet, including this building. The Bible says, he that builded all things is God. <laughs> but you think you are the one building it. The materials that are put together to create, God is the one that created it. The wisdom is from him. The strength is from him. The vessel that is doing that work, he created it. everything. So you see, there is no place for man to take glory of it. He said we are just like workmanship. You know what is workmanship? Tools you are using to work, that is what you are. So he has the right to shape you the way he wants or to destroy you or do whatever. That is, is his prerogative, is his right. You can't question him. You are not yourself. He even say in the New Testament, after all this, he said you have now been bought with a price. You are no longer your own. You can't live, you can't run this life the way you want to run it. You can't run your life. You can't just wake up and say, this is what I want to do. You have to find out what he wants you to do. Waking up and doing things your own way is rebellion from him. That's why he said everything, whether they are in heaven or on earth, even the ones that are in heaven, he made all of them. The throne of God and all of that, he made them. The new heaven and the new earth we're talking about, he's the one. The Jerusalem we are going to go, he is the one. Every single thing. And then he now said, visible. The one that you can see, okay. V invisible. What are those invisible things? Can you mention them? Those invisibles. Demons. Angels. The beasts. The cherubims. The seraphim. There are so many of them all that we cannot see. He is the one that made them. So who will you be afraid? And that person that made all this in is your friend. He's your friend. <laughs> he said he's not even a friend, he's a brother. You don't, you don't believe it. Should I show you? He's not just your friend. He's not just a friend. He's your brother. He's written in Hebrew chapter 2. He said he's not ashamed to call us his brethren, his brothers and sisters. Jesus is my brother. And he's one that made all these things. Whether they are seen or unseen, visible or whether in heaven or on earth, he's the one that made all of them. And he's my father. He's my God. He's my brother. He's my everything. So who will I be afraid of? Is you understand, when you begin to, you see, you see, is to grow your root. So when we stand speak, we say go to 
Okay, let's finish this one, please. Just go to verse. He said, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible or invisible, whether they be thrones, whether they be dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. The thrones and dominions and all of that he's talking about here is not um, spiritual wickedness in the high places and uh, powers and principalities. And that's not what he's talking about. In God's own order, hierarchy, there are thrones followed by dominion. Then principalities are power. That's where the demon, devil copied what he was doing. That's where he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and uh, rulers of darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. That's where he copied those hierarchy. He set his own government, copied from, he's a copycat. There's nothing original that he does. I say he is before how many things? And you know, you know how you can be talking about, discussing about um, Adenuga now, trying to, to trying to grasp spiritual things, things because we can't see it with our eye. Let me tell you, the extent to which you know this truth is the extent to which you grow deep, and is the extent to which the glory and the power of God is made manifest in your life. Is a function of revelation knowledge. That is why your commitment, your commit, the level of your commitment here, our level of commitment to Christ are not the same. The reason is because the level of your knowledge and understanding of him is the level to which you give your life to him. The level to which you commit your life to him. The level to which you are ready to go the extra mile for him. The extent to which you are ready to lay down that your life for him. Knowing that he has ability. Knowing that his words are final. They are irrevocable. Knowing that with him all things are possible. Knowing that he calls things that are not in existence as though they were in existence. When you know these things, there are things when you know, you will realize. The more you know it, the more you realize. The more you know it, the more you lay down your guards. You know, there is no evil with him. There is no shadow of turning with him. All good things and perfect gifts, they come from above. They come from the Father of light in whom there is no evil or variableness or anything like that with him. God is good. There is no evil with him. Even when he is punishing you, he is punishing you out of love. He is not punishing you to kill, to destroy you. He is to restore you. When he is chastising you, he is not chastising you to destroy you. He is to clean you up. You should know that. He is a father. He is loving. He's caring. He rebukes the ones that he loves. You must know God. You must know. That is why when they talk about the love of God, they use a love, 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 love. And somebody said that God is so loved that he cannot send anybody to hell and all of that. No, you don't know him. It's not his will that any man should perish, but he cannot force you at the same time. He has given you everything that it takes to know him. And you rejected him. He doesn't have any other option because he's holy and pure and clean. And you can't come to him. You can't come to the place where he with filthiness and all of that. No. And you need to choose your, of your own to lay them aside, to keep them away from you. If you don't, the blood is there for him to take it, to wash you and clean you up. But you refuse. God can never go against your will. God is good. All the time. It's not a slogan. It's not something we are saying in order to get us excited. It's a fact of life. It's a truth. 
So that's why we must know who this man is. It's not just Jesus for the sake of Jesus. Jesus. It's not in the screaming of his name, but you, you can scream. As a, res, as a result of, you know, when you are full of him, when you are charged up inside of you and all of that, it comes out with force, with power. Sometimes the way it comes out, but it is not in that way. It's not because of that that something will happen. Jesus, the foundation of our Christian faith. That is why if you don't study, if you don't read after him, if you don't study about Christ, let me show you something. Second Corinthians 3, 16. Go to 14. He said, but their minds... Let's go to, go to 13. Let me see. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Okay? But their minds were blinded, for until this day remained the same veil, on taking away in the reading of the old what? Testament. The veil is still there. Do you know why? You keep reading the... That's why all this corruption and all of that they are bringing from the pulpit is from the old days and they will carry it and be rubbing it in your faces, in our faces. You sow this seed, you sow the other seed, you do the other one, you do the other one. You burn candle, you bring this one. They say, do you bring matches, you bring broom, you do all those things. And then you carry sand, you carry dust, you carry all those things. You know all those things we do? Witchcraft, Old Testament. The thing is that everything in the Old Testament is pointing to Christ. Every single thing there. He said, but, but their minds were blinded all for until this day remained the same veil on taking away in the reading of the Old Testament. Which veil is done away when you come to Christ, when you read after him, when you learn after him, when you study Christ. If you are studying any other thing you are studying, is to gain wisdom and the principle by which Jesus Christ lived. But the cross of the whole matter is that everything was pointing at him. It's about Christ. And that is why he said in verse 15, but even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. Moses is the law. When you read, when you stay, there are people who don't, when you talk about, they tell you that they don't read the epistle, they don't read the gospel, they don't read this, they don't read, it's the Old Testament where they stay, they read. And even when they read the New Testament, they go and read those, um, the, um, um, the Jewish lifestyle and traditions and all of that. They, they, they dwell in, the, that's why the Bible calls it um, 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 old wives' fables and then lay genealogies and all of that. That's what he's talking about. Minds are blinded. When you stay on Christ, Christ is, stay on Christ, you will be sound. When you understand it, when you go now to read the Old Testament, it will make a whole lot of sense. You will be catching revelation everywhere. Any page you turn. Because everything now you understood the pattern. You know, everything is the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament. The Old Testament is talking about Christ. You leave the you just holding on to the shadow. So he said, but even on to this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their hearts. Verse 16. Nevertheless, when he shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Verse 17. He say, now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Lord is that spirit. Because Jesus is the word. And the word, I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. The Holy Spirit and the word is the same. The Bible calls it in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. He said, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Two size of the same coin. You can't separate the two. So you come and tell me the Holy Spirit said, and he's not saying what the word of God is saying. Hey, you are in error, my brother. You are in error, my sister. Mm -mm. I will not take it. It's wrong. If you take it, if you agree, yeah, if you don't agree, that's your business. Many have been destroyed because of this. Hebrews chapter 4, Isaiah 28, 16. 
Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, not just a stone, but this particular stone has been tried, tried, tested. You say a stone, a tried stone, a precious stone, a sure foundation. Why is it precious and sure? Because it has been tested. It has been proven. I didn't just give you a stone. I didn't just give you a stone and say, take this stone and build this house. You know, there are different kinds of stones. There is metamorphic stone. There is igneous rock. There is sedimentary rock. There are three types. Sedimentary is the one that is in between. You can't use it to build a house. If you use it, it will crash. And uh, metamorphic. Metamorphic means it changes. It has not fully translated to its original, uh, to its, um, so if you use that one, it will be undergoing changes inside your block and inside your house, and one day it will crash. There is one that has been proven and has been tested. is the igneous rock. Jesus Christ is a man. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is, that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our what? Profession. The word profession is confession. Let's hold fast our confession, what we are saying about his word, so that you don't doubt. Why? Verse 15 tells us, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all, in how many points? Did what? Tempted like as we are, yet we dare say. The man was proven, tested, though he was a son. <laughs> they tested his obedience through suffering. He stood. That's why he's a rock. That's why he's a rock. Isaiah 28, 16. That's why he said, Therefore, thus said the Lord, Behold, I lay in Zion a foundation, a stone, a tri stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that does what believeth in him shall not make haste. You won't run ahead of him. You will wait. You will follow him. He that believed in him. The man was tempted. He was tried. He didn't buckle. He didn't find alternative routes. On the cross, you know, after all those beatings and all of that, they gave him vinegar to drink. He said, I taste. The guy had lost a lot of blood. In that kind of state, his throat was very dry. He has lost blood. He was very weak. And then the pains of all the floggings and the nails. And the one, the crown they put on his head and smashed it with the reed. The headache he said was, so he said, I taste. In that pain, they gave him vinegar. You know what is vinegar? It's a painkiller. Short gun. He said, no. He tasted it and knew it was vinegar on the tongue. He refused. He wanted to go full length. Is it after all this thing you'll come and be telling me cook and story about Jesus Christ? I, my, I would rather, <laughs> even if they say tomorrow that he is fake, I would rather, I will continue following him. You see where faith comes. You see where confidence comes. You see where trust comes. The more you know this, the more you stay on it, the more you dwell on it, the more you reflect on it, the more you meditate on it, the more you imagine it, the more you are going there. You know how they dig? There is a way they dig a soccer way. They will first do the casting on the ground. When they finish casting it on the ground, they will now enter inside and begin to remove the soil. As they are removing it, the thing is going down. Going down. That is what happens as you begin to meditate and the thing. The thing is, your, your root is growing deep.
deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. The deeper the root, the more it is able to withstand pressure, more to withstand the storm, the flood, the wind of life. The more your root goes down, the more it is able to weather the storm of life. And that storm of life you were able to weather is what produces the character of Christ in you. Without it, you can't build any character. Forget about it. It's not in praying. You finish praying, you are going to go through it. You can't bring, you can't produce character outside of this. Give me Romans chapter 5, verse 3. Verse 3 says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh what? Patience is one aspect of a character. And patience, experience, and experience, hope. These are characters. Men who through faith and patience. You can't build character outside of tests. James chapter 1 verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this that the trying of your faith worketh what? Patience. Verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You come to a point where you can say like Paul, I've been crucified to the world and the world has been crucified unto me. That's what is no longer I that live but Christ that lives in me. His tribulation and trials, that's what produced Christ. Though he was a son of God, who knew no sin? There was no sin in him. When he died on the third day, his body was still fresh. Even if his body was still in the grave till today, more than 2,000 years later, if you go to the grave and touch him, his body will still be fresh. No corruption because there is no sin. He was sinless. Nothing would have happened to him. The way he was, he was everything clean. But God subjected him to test. Give me Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10. For he became him for whom are all things, the same Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect. You know some of us who don't want stress. You don't want stress. That's why Paul would say, let no man again trouble me. Because if you look at my body, you know the guy received 39 strokes. <laughs> Bulala at the back. That is talking. If you remove his clothes, you see the mark. Your own, if they remove your own, it's like a mirror. They will even be seeing their faces on your back because everything will still be shining. When you see this guy's back, when you see their back, you see gutters that are healed with this care. Scars all over. Scars all over. And guess what? When you get to heaven, you see have it. He just have his own. But not in that state. What have you done for Christ? And they ask you now, what is the price? What has happened? That you can say yes. You know what he said? Those who have suffered in the flesh. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. You know why we are still struggling? Uh, fornication, immorality, you know, those whatever we are still because we've not borne the mark of Jesus Christ on our body. He's a captain of our salvation. Look at him. Look unto Christ. He didn't say to look unto any other person. Paul said, because a lot of people quote, quote, quote that scripture, and they just leave it. He said, follow me, because Paul said, follow me. But that is not what just Paul said. 
They don't want to come because half education is worse than because they will twist it to their your own destruction. He said, follow me while I am following Christ. As long as I am follow Christ, follow me. I just wanted to, I don't want to rush it. There are other things I would have said, I would have done one and two, but I just wanted to stay and clean up this particular aspect because it's of great importance in our Christian work. The reason why we don't have strong faith today is because of lack of understanding of the foundation. Because we don't know Christ. If you know him, some are saying, you know, some say he's, a, he's not a prophet. He says he's, he's not an apostle. He's not a prophet. He is God. And God doesn't fail. God is good. Hell was made for Satan and his demons and the fallen angels. They were never made for man. That's why God said it is not his will that any man should perish. It is his will that every man should be saved. One. Number two. Come to the knowledge of the truth. But when God has revealed himself as God to them, they will 